sorry about that. Hey, I'm doing a video about something else. I, you just caught me off guard. I was just jamming over that groove to Stairway to Heaven. So I wanted to answer a question today. The question came, was basically two or three questions. And, and the question was basically to the effect that uh, at some point in your career, do your fingers just kind of find out all the things they're supposed to do? Don't they just kind of figure it out? You've been playing for years, so don't you kind of understand all the possibilities that are available? Um, also, another part of that question was, uh, do you process, like, how do you process the music? Do you do it, like, mentally, or do you do it by listening, and like, with your ear, or is it about your fingers, right? And um, the final question is, you know, if, if you were to just practice lots of patterns and practicing listening around those patterns, then why learn music theory? And those are basically the questions I'm going to answer in this video. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but before I do, I want to make sure you know about this channel, about me. My name is Chris Howes, and I am here to help musicians, especially classically trained string players, to develop more confidence, more freedom of expression, and more understanding about how you can move forward in music. So I'm, I'm putting out free videos almost every day, so you should definitely subscribe and click the links below to learn all the different ways you can work with me. So let me go on to answering these questions. Um, again, the first question is, um, at a certain point after you've been playing for a long time, isn't it true that your your four fingers basically know what to do? They're just gonna, they're, they should just find the answers. Um, so, and oh, and also that they're gonna play all the patterns available. And so in my humble opinion, this is all in my humble opinion, with 12 notes in four octaves on the violin, I can only guess the math here, but my assumption is that many lifetimes would not give us the ability to truly know all the sequences or patterns or iterations, in other words, the different combinations that we could put our fingers down on the violin. That's my assumption. Um, but if the question is more meaning something like, you know, i.e., once we know a scale or once we know a few chords pretty well, at some point, should we be able to develop the confidence and a language with which we can express ourselves over at least certain types of rhythmic and harmonic forms? Like, for example, Stairway to Heaven, right? You know, this one. <laughs> you know, then, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, you know, for example, with, with Stairway to Heaven, if you learn the A minor um, pentatonic scale, you know, well, that's pretty obnoxious. <laughs> if you learn that pentatonic scale, then you could probably do a lot with it, it over, over this. So I do agree with that, um, but there's I think it's a really there's going to be some important caveats I'm going to bring into that though, uh, and furthermore I believe many musicians can say a lot with whatever language or whatever theory or technical ability you have despite whatever limitations you have right now. Um, a great example of this was Les Paul, who many people think of as an American icon and who I thought of as a good friend. I played with Les Paul for 14 years when he was between the age of 80 and 94. And during that time, he basically had like two fully functioning fingers on his left hand and he would use his thumb a lot too, but really, you know, his, his right arm had been broken like 20 years before, and so it was set weird. And like, so Les Paul had all these uh, physical limitations at the time, but he made a lot of music every week. Um, so I, I honestly believe that we all have limitations and just having a little bit of language or a little bit of information or a little bit of theory can be enough to express yourself really fully, really creatively in some situations, some musical situations, especially, you know, what, so, but this, this begs the question, actually, you know, how much does a musician actually need to learn? Um, and like I said, I think that often a musician can say a lot with what you've got, but it depends on context. Um, for example, I might be comfortable playing over a rock groove because I know that groove, um, but then suddenly if I try to play over a bluegrass tune, 
uh, I may not be as comfortable because maybe I didn't, I haven't learned that language yet, and whether rhythmic language, harmonic language, melodic language, whatever it might be. So context is really important. And I actually think this is one of the things that holds a lot of us back because we might have a success in one situation, one musical context, but then we go into a different, a, a musical context that somehow is different. We may not even realize that, how it's different. Um, and then we struggle and then that throws us off actually. So this is one of the things that I actually help a lot of my private students with, and, you know, so, um, but anyway, um, the same is true of, of any harmonic language for sure. So like the guitar solo in Stairway to Heaven, it uses three chords that can easily be navigated using the A minor pentatonic scale, but to play, you can, that means you can basically play any note from the scale and it'll sound good. <laughs> um, but this same strategy may not apply in a tune like Giant Steps by John Coltrane, right? So let me see if I can address this really quickly. Let me see if I can illustrate this. You know, so we've got the A minor pentatonic scale. So I can almost play any note there. You know, and so that strategy, using that scale and just plugging it into the rhythmic grid works really there, really well there on Stairway to Heaven. But if I take this, John Coltrane, Giant Steps, it's hard for me to find the same strategy there. So, um... You know? Uh... You know, it's just, it's a whole different ball of wax. See what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I was struggling with that Coltrane progression right there. Um, so we can't use this one strategy in every context. And that context might be a harmonic context, or it might be a stylistic context, or a rhythmic context. Those are all different things. Like a rhythmic context could be like a rock groove, which is like, dum, dum, tick, dum, 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 tick. But then all of a sudden it's like a different groove. Let's say it's in seven, dum, dum, tick, dum, go, and get, or something like that. And it's like, wait a second. <laughs> um, so you've got rhythmic contexts, you've got harmonic contexts, and then you've got general style contexts, right? Um, so this, the next question here is, you know, how do I think about the music? Do I think about it in terms of in my head, like seeing note names or seeing a staff, or do I hear the sound, or do I just think about finger patterns? And this is an awesome question. This is an awesome question. Um, what comes to my mind is that there's four ways that I personally might perceive a musical note. So one is on a staff, like seeing it on a staff in my head. Number two is on the violin fingerboard. So seeing my fingers. Uh, three is the sound of it. And four is the note name. So those are four different ways that I can understand the same thing, one musical note. Um, and, and whether I rely more heavily on one or another of those ways, I'm not totally sure to be honest with you because I kind of think of all those things in interchangeable ways um, but let's consider that that if I have the ability to uh, see color in sound or see colors in um, in pitches which I don't remember the name of this ability but some people when they hear a note they can actually see a color that goes with that right um, or if I had a higher degree of perfect pitch because I have something close to perfect pitch, but I think there are people that have a higher degree of perfect pitch than I do, then I would have more ways of understanding the note that I do. But I don't have those abilities. So obviously I, like everybody else, rely on the abilities that I do have to perceive a given musical note. Now, if someone is blind, if someone is born blind, they can never see, then they go through life without that ability. But they strengthen other abilities like hearing and smell, or so I understand, that's, what's, that's what happens often. So similarly, if a musician 
never learns to read music, then they presumably develop um, better ears and better memories. Um, and so in this way, I feel like we all have different strengths and different you know, skills and different ways that we perceive music. Um, some of us are more heavy on reading, on theory, on ears. Um, and the more we can strengthen any one of these, I presume that it'll help us. I presume that the more ways we have to understand music, that that is helpful. But I'm not sure that that's correct. Um, like, for example, if you've never learned to read music and you're really good at, at hearing music and you have a great memory, I guess an argument could be made that by your learning to read music and learning theory, that that would help you. Like, maybe it would, but it might be a lot of work, right? So would that be worth it or not? I honestly don't know. I know that for me, I've spent a lot of time trying to um, improve my ears and improve kind of my understanding of theory, for lack of a better word, because I think theory is kind of a loaded word. Um, and I feel that that all helps me. I feel like my ears have gotten stronger and also that my understanding of some aspect of harmonic theory, rhythmic theory, I feel like that's gotten stronger as well. And more on that in a minute about theory. Um, so my point is that that's been my experience, that the more that I develop each of these perceptual faculties or, or ways of knowing, ways of understanding music, that it's helped me. Um, but I don't want to prescribe that that's going to be the case for every single person. Maybe it's not going to be worth it for you, but maybe it's going to be incredibly revelatory, which brings to mind for me this piece that I saw on NPR the other day. Um, NPR did a piece about a person in their 50s with Asperger's. Um, Asperger, people with Asperger's are apparently missing the use of a function in their brain that, which is what allows most of us to read into the meaning, the social meaning of spoken words. So like sarcasm or irony, or if you're teasing somebody or, if, or humor, these kinds of things, like maybe we don't think about it because we take it for granted, but when you're hearing me talk, you're hearing a lot of tone in the way that I talk. And people with Asperger's, from what I understand, they don't have the ability to really catch the subtlety of tone in human speech. Um, so in, this, in the case of this person who was in their 50s, there was a, um, this, uh, this treatment that involved an experimental treatment that involved putting a magnet, some kind of magnet on their brain. And then when that happened for the first time in 50 years, this person could actually do those things that we all take for granted. They could read into the tone of speech like sarcasm, irony, and humor. And so suddenly it was this massive revelation, huge revelation. And this person with Asperger's like had this flashback over 50 years of their life and was like, all these things that I missed that I never saw before, now I get it. And it was like really, really revelatory, like really powerful because, you know, I guess part of the context of this was that this person felt that they were always struggling in social context and it was really hard for them. Um, so, so when this person was given suddenly the ability to perceive um, words in this way, it was huge for them. And even though they couldn't do it all the time, because it only happened when they put, the, put this magnet on their brain, they were grateful that they had experience. And so, you know, the question is, could we put a magnet on our brain and all of a sudden improve our ears? I'm not sure that we could right? Could we put a magnet on our brain and all of a sudden understand harmony? Well, that might be tricky too. Although I have a course that can kind of help you do something similar and it's called easy tone improvisation. And so what I do is I create these visual diagrams 
And it's sort of like that. It gives you the clues to voice leading and it's really, really powerful. So I would encourage you to check the link below and, and check that out because I usually give at least part of it away for free. So you want to make sure that you check and find that because it is powerful if you're somebody that wants to understand more about harmony. Um, so, but let me, let me talk about theory. Let me talk about theory. Musicians who feel, if you feel that you're missing some component of theory, I want to address that. Um, there are many musicians who didn't, who haven't studied theory, quote unquote, but they presumably have their own sort of theory. Um, in other words, music theory, let's say, for example, may dictate that a chord is a major seven chord. Right, uh, but a musician who does not know the name major seven may have another name for this chord. You might have some point of reference, whether it's your fingering, whether it's in your ears. You know, um, maybe it's like a lick that you learned that like makes some meaning out of that sound, the major seven chord, that gives you an anchor to somehow know what you want to do with that major seven chord. Like the fact that somebody called it a major seven chord in, in a book somewhere, that's, that's arbitrary, right? They could have called it a, 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 a blue elephant. And then that would just be what it's called. That's what music theory is. Like music theory is people calling things, things. <laughs> it's like calling music, calling musical events, things, and then sort of, talking about how those musical events have happened historically. That's kind of what music theory is, but you could have called it other things. And so that's why I'm saying like, if your reference point is, oh, I know that I use my fourth finger and it goes here, or it sounds like this, then you have your own anchor for understanding what a major seven chord is. And I think that every musician has some way that they understand the things that they understand. And we also, every musician has a point at which there's something they don't understand. Like every one of us has a limit in terms of what we can hear, how to make sense of certain musical events. Like, I don't know what, it depends what those events are, but music is so big. We just, none of us really can hear it all, can understand it all, can keep up with it all. So we've all got limits. We've all got things that we know and things we don't know. Um... But anyway, going back to this idea of, you know, how you might understand a major seven chord, even if you haven't studied, quote unquote, music theory, instead of calling it theory, let's call it applied theory or practical theory or functional theory. In other words, anything that gives you an understanding and confidence in what you want to do musically in any given context. That to me is so much more important than music theory. Because music theory is just this, you know, books and books and books and books and books. <laughs> you know, but the idea of, I want to know, I want to feel like I understand and know what I want to do in any given musical situation, that to me is useful. That's what you want. You don't want music theory. <laughs> but you, but sometimes, general theoretical harmony or a theory about rhythm, you know, from different perspectives, sometimes it will help you to be able to do the things you want. Um, so again, I think that this applied theory or functional theory, practical theory is very contextual. So a musician could have an understanding of how to navigate the harmony or rhythm of a funk tune, but not a bossa nova. And in order to feel comfortable with that bossa nova, you might need to develop other theory, right? You have to get more knowledge, some kind of knowledge, so that you can understand the bossa nova, even though you already understand uh, a funk tune. You know what you want to do on a funk tune, but you don't know what you want to do on a bossa. So you're going to learn something about a bossa that's going to help you play over that bossa, right? Makes sense? So um, whether or not that answer comes from a textbook you know, it may depend on you and or it may depend on the textbook. 
that answer might come from, you know, a teacher. It might come from somebody like me. Like you might ask me the question <laughs> in a lesson and I might be like, well, what if you try this? Or what if you try that? Or what if you try this? That's the difference between like just one textbook on theory and having like a knowledgeable mentor who can help you see things from different angles. Um, An important distinction to make about music theory for classical musicians is that it is highly Eurocentric. And and really, it mostly applies to classical music. So we could apply some, you know, classical music theory concepts in jazz music or Latin music or pop music. Um, but um, I learned a lot about playing blues and jazz, for example, from a great pianist and organist named Bobby Floyd. And and just as sort of an analogy or as an anecdote, you know, Bobby didn't wouldn't necessarily quote from a music theory textbook when I would ask him questions, you know, cuz my question would be like how do I play this song? You know, how how do I say something better on this song and sound as good as you, Mr. Floyd, <laughs> basically? Cuz every note Bobby plays is amazing and I've got some videos on this channel with with Bobby Floyd if you look for him. Um, and he just constantly, you know, he's just constantly giving me gentle whoopings. You know, he's, he's just, he's the best, you know. And when I play with him, I'm always trying to learn from him. But I would, you know, I would ask him very theoretical questions. You know, like, um, so were you thinking about an augmented chord when you did that thing right there? <laughs> um, but his answers were, were not necessarily what you would think about if you think about typical music theory. It would be more like he might say something. I'm just, he might say, Chris, you know, I'm just focused on playing in the pocket or like making sure that my, my rhythmic feel is really good or like whatever I play, I'm just trying to make sure that it feels good, you know, or he might say that um, something that guides his playing is like listening for the spirit, you know? So these are just, you know, examples and I'm paraphrasing obviously um, Bobby and you should reach out to him and check out his work, Bobby Floyd. Dot com, But the point is, the way he explained it was totally different than these kind of typical theoretical questions. And, you know, Bobby grew up playing in church in Marion, Ohio, and he learned by ear. So he has his own theory, if you want to call it that, for how he approaches the music. But it's, that's not the same thing as what you're going to necessarily find in a music theory book. Um... So I feel like this is also like where we could also talk about separating music theory from music, musical values, although they are related. So for example, Bach relies on certain values, right? Like I could say that like if I play this little piece by Bach, like I just want you to think about what is the value that I'm really focused on uh, expressing. Oh, that's the wrong one. Here we go. So what is what are the values that I'm focused on expressing? Sorry for my intonation, by the way, <laughs> which I guess would be one, right? It was like, am I in tune? You know, but <laughs> what I was thinking about was the connectivity of the phrase because it's this really long phrase and so you've got to hold this one note, but then connect it the whole time into the longer phrase. So as I train classical musicians, those are the, some of the things that my teachers really fostered in me. Is like play the phrase, connect every note, focus on your bow arm. So, you know, those are values that I bring to when I play Bach that I really focus on. Um, now, but if I was playing a tune by, let's say, James Brown, then I would probably focus on different values. There would be other things that are more important to me. So maybe that, that continuity of my bow wouldn't be as important, but maybe the rhythm would be much more important, for example. Um, so I feel like the way that we understand listening to James Brown and listening to Bach is also different. So whether we're listening for the feeling of the groove, for example, or whether we're listening for intonation, expressive intonation, you know, phrasing choices in a Bach piece, whatever it might be, 
And so I think how we approach or succeed playing these types of music may be different. Um, you see what I mean? <laughs> um, but the, I guess the point is that if I have never played music by James Brown or listened to it, but I've played a lot of Bach, then all the theory in the world that I have about playing Bach may not really mean anything when it comes to me trying to say something on the music of James Brown. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, so maybe what I need to do is learn more about theory in the context of the music of James Brown or the music of John Coltrane, right? And there was a good video the other day by Adam Neely about music theory, and there's been a lot of good discussion uh, from other sources as well. Uh, I'm a member of a free uh, Facebook group that is called Decolonizing the Music Room. And I think this is a really important discussion people are having in general right now because it's really paying, um, it's really shining a light on the fact that music theory has been um, distorted. You know, the way that music theory has been taught has been only teaching a Eurocentric form of music theory at the expense of many other uh, theories about music, perspectives on music. So I think that's that's really um, important just in general. Now here's the here's the the last question I will answer, which is, you know, if you were to practice lots of patterns and practice listening with your ear, then why learn music theory? Why learn music theory? It's a great question. And again, going back to this context of of, of this. If you learn that that A minor pentonic scale, or if you learn like a strategy or a set of values or a way to play over that particular thing, you may not need to learn anything else because you've got your way of approaching it. So that's the first thing I'll say. You should only learn whatever you need to learn to do a specific thing. <laughs> In other words. Uh, it's all about context. If you want to play Giant Steps by John Coltrane, which is a tune with a lot of modulating chords, and if you've never dealt with that song before or that style or with a lot of modulating chords, then presumably you will want to learn some way of dealing with modulating chords and swing rhythm and the language of John Coltrane. Um, and there could be many ways to explain it, but I do think that music is very diverse, and we can, while we can understand some music very well, we may still need to figure out somehow to understand different kinds of music. So whether you want to call theory, call it music theory, or you want to call it some kind of theory, you're going to want to learn it. <laughs> you're going to want to, you know, depending on a, if you're trying to learn a new kind of music that's unfamiliar to you, a new kind of musical problem that's unfamiliar to you, whether that's rhythmic, harmonic, stylistic, then chances are you will need something new to help you deal with that. And it may not be a music theory textbook. Again, it could be the right mentor with, with a perspective on that particular problem and, and also maybe somebody that shares something in common with you. So for example, part of the reason I think that I'm a very effective mentor for a lot of classically trained string players is because I am a classically trained string player. And so I've been through these exact problems and I've had to think about it and I've had to wrestle with it from a lot of different angles, which is why I would say, connect with me, check the links below, find different ways to work with me. But it doesn't have to be me. There might be other mentors out there that are connected into that music that you want to learn and have the ability to understand where you're coming from with your classical training, in which case reach out to them. But you will want to have more theory if you're going into a new kind of music. But you, because just because you've been playing 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you've only learned the things that you've learned. And so I see a lot of people who kind of shut down because they don't want to acknowledge that there's something that they just haven't learned yet. And this, this question sort of is implying that. It's like, hey, I've been playing, if I've been playing for 40 years, haven't my, hasn't my ears just told me everything I need to know? Haven't my fingers done it all? Chances are, in my humble opinion, definitely not.
in my in my humble opinion. And the more that we're able to make those distinctions about the things we do know and the things we don't know, the healthier sense of self-awareness we have about you know, our musicianship. And then we can make an informed choice. You can be like, you know, I really don't want to learn about that thing. <laughs> I don't need to work on playing in 13-8. <laughs> you know, I'm good doing this thing. You know, I think that's useful and healthy. Um, so uh, let me see. I'm about to wrap this up now. Um, yeah, I guess what I was saying, um, none of us can do everything. So the question is, do you want to be able to do this thing or not? You know, when, a, when the piano player that you work with, they do some like really sweet reharmonization, right? Like they change the chord and you're like, oh man, that was so cool. Um, well, do you want to figure that out or not? Like you get to choose that battle because you can either stop and be like, what did you just do? <laughs> you know, or, or it's like, can I ask you to explain that to me? And then, then you can see whether or not that's something you want to learn about. And maybe you need to sit down at the piano and figure it out. Maybe you want to pick it up on the guitar. Maybe you want to try to figure it out theoretically. Maybe you want to try to hear it. Like, but you get to decide. Um, and that's a choice for you to make. Yeah. And, and similarly, like, well, do you want to be able to play 14 instruments or are you good with playing one instrument? Like you get to decide, do you want to learn six foreign languages or are you good just with like one language? You know, do you want a bigger house or not? <laughs> we all have to decide like the battles we want to pick, the things we really want to fight for, you know? We can't learn everything, but I think it is valuable to, to, to go after certain things for sure. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude with this. In my humble opinion, uh, when it comes to our goals to grow as musicians, I feel like there's kind of a, a binary choice to bear in mind. So one is, how can you say more or be more with what you already know? Like if you know that pentatonic scale and like that's your kind of uh, your weapon of choice, like how can you be even better, more consistent with the tools, with the tools that you use. So that's one facet of what we do as musicians. It's just like, how can I, how can I play more consistently? How can I play more thoughtfully using what I already know? I think that's a very important area uh, to, to go into. And then on the other side, it's like, what are the new skills or the new knowledge that I want to acquire that would help me? I mean, both sides of these things are really, really important. And I think the most important of all of this is self-awareness, knowing our limits, knowing our strengths, knowing our goals, and owning our choices. So again, these are the kinds of things that I like to help musicians with um, to gain more confidence, to gain more understanding about the things that are in alignment with your goals and your vision for the kind of musician you want to be and the kind of life you want to have as a musician, whether that involves your career, your teaching, um, just sharing your work, the community that you want to foster, whatever that is. So stay connected with me. Look, check the links below and